Well, tonight's the last night. You've done very well to make it through to here, and I think you get double points for coming out tonight. So uh, thanks for being here. It is our last night. We're looking at Together We Grow, and we're just going to bow together in prayer, and I'll hand over to Murray. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for our time together tonight. We, um, we're aware that uh, it's just not a group of people, but you are here with us. Uh, prompt us by your spirit, and we're open to learn. So open our minds and our hearts so that what we take on board will affect us uh, in the days of each week. Uh, we commit Murray to you as he shares from your word. We pray, Father, that uh, your word will speak to us in a very special way tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, good. I'm on. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, double points. But, you know, I've played 18 holes of golf in this today, so, you know. <laughs> There's one born every day. <laughs> um, I think that's what my wife said, basically, as I left <laughs> this morning. Um, but great to be with you again this evening. And just before I get into the passage tonight, just can I just thank you for the opportunity with Neil to share with you guys over the last five weeks. It's been an uh, absolute privilege for me and I trust that some of what we've done has uh, given you food for thought and uh, things to go on with. So thank you very much. The, the, the um, passage that uh, we're going to look at tonight, or we're, we're thinking about Together We Grow, and the passage for our final Bible talk is one that will actually be quite familiar to many of you. Uh, it's Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 25, if you want to grab your Bible and be ready. Uh, we'll have it up on the screen shortly. And in the NIV, the heading there uh, in that passage is a call to persevere in faith. It's interesting, in my experience, this is a passage that's sometimes used uh, typically um, by pastors, to belt Christians around the ears with to increase the numbers on a Sunday morning and stop people sleeping in. You know, it's that passage about don't neglect meeting together. Um, and I'm sure it's never been used that way in uh, Hume Ridge Church, but it may have been in Wesleyan Methodist Church in other days. Um, but I want to suggest that that's not how, in a sense, it's supposed to be read. But rather, this is a passage that, to me, is more carrot than stick, if you know what I mean. It's more encouragement than it is reprimand. It's more designed to help us to appreciate the importance of Christian community and to actually increase our desire to meet together, to gather, because we uh, grow together. So rather than a call to persevere in faith, which of course it is, it could easily be the title, same title as our session tonight, which is Together We Grow. The whole point of this pa very familiar passage, uh, for many of you, I think, is that we actually need each other if we're going to grow and flourish in the Christian life. The times when we gather as a church community are a great opportunity to just cast that vision of whole life, missional discipleship that we've been exploring over these last four or five Wednesday evenings. So what we practice together in church is what we live out on Mondays through to Saturdays. A friend of mine says, Sunday morning is the locker room and then it's game on. And so I want you to get that sense that uh, when we gather, it's the locker room. It's the time to think about and, and rehearse the plays, I guess. So please follow me in whatever version of the Bible you've got or just up on the screen there as uh, we read this passage together from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. So the writer to the Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to our, for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God... And then we go on, because of all that that we've just heard, this is what you should do. Let us, and note that it's plural, it's together, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, 
and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from, the, from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we, plural again, profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So, three thoughts as to how when we gather, we can actually be a great encouragement to one another, how we can, in a sense, disciple one another and how that links to some of the things that we've been sharing and studying together. So the first one, or the first thought is, that we, we have to hold on to hope together. As a church family, we're to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, end of verse 23. I like the way the message puts it. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. I like that. We actually need help, don't we, to hold on to this faith because it's so easy to lose hope, isn't it? It's easy to stray from faith, stray from the path, to lose sight of the things that are actually central to who we are or who we want to be. Or if you went back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, the writer says, if we don't pay careful attention to what we've heard, we may simply drift. And the picture there is almost like a boat on a river just drifting along and over time drifting away. And I've no doubt that you've seen this happen, either perhaps periods of your own seasons of your own life or in people that you hold dear. Do you remember this image? As we scatter our Sunday lives, we're the red dots, but you'll notice what's happening to the ones on the screen. They start, they'll start to go grey over time with the pressures of the world around us. So the writer to the Hebrews suggests three ways that we should hold on to our hope so that we should stay red and not go grey. The first one is draw near to God. So in the Old Testament, it was only the priests, wasn't it? The ones who'd been separated out for that purpose, they were the ones who came to God. But now it's open to us all, thank goodness, because Jesus has opened the way for us. And so anytime, anywhere, of course, we can actually draw near to God. It doesn't have to be in a holy place like this, all right? But in a special way, I think, as we gather on Sunday or in our life groups and we participate in song and prayer listen to scripture, sermons, as we break bread together around the Lord's table, things Christians have done for centuries that help them to focus on the presence of God. All of those habits and practices help us to hold on to our hope in Jesus, help us to stay the course. We don't just do them because they're sort of routines, but they build in us and remind us of the hope. They shape us. Secondly, be encouraged because we have complete assurance of our faith. As we focus on Jesus, we discover who we are because of what he's done for us. Neil talked about this the other week. Our identity as sons and daughters of the Father is reaffirmed as we gather together. Uh, and as we meet, in a sense, with fellow members of the family. Now, here's a thought. We get to see the family likeness. Now, that could be a worry for some of you. We'll just leave that one right there. And then thirdly, we experience peace as we come with the things that are weighing heavily on our lives and on our hearts. We discover actually we've been sprinkled with his blood. We're renewed. We're refreshed. We're reminded that our bodies, of our bodies being washed with pure water, as the passage says. So I think in some ways we need to stop seeing Sunday mornings as some sort of an event you know, like a concert or a theatre or going to the footy. Um, but we need to see it as a, a gathering of family, a community, um, a, a bringing our whole person to meet with fellow believers who will remind us of the hope that we have in Jesus, who will remind us of the story that we're in because we're sons and daughters 
of the living God. Second point, we're to spur one another on to good works. Spur is a really strong word. It actually has this idea of inciting or provoking and sort of a strange word when you think about it being linked to good works, being incited and provoked. But I guess the strength of that underlines the importance of helping one another to live out our faith on our front lines. Turn my page. It's not something passive. It's actually an active posture we take towards one another. So I'm thinking when I meet with my fellow believers, how can I help Bill or Mary or whatever, whoever, to keep on doing good works? Works which Ephesians reminds us that God has actually prepared in advance for us to do. How can, how can I do that? What a mentality that would be if I came to Sunday mornings with a mentality of who can I encourage today in the works that God's already planned for them to do? Now, I don't know about you, but I actually find at times I grow weary of doing good. Sometimes that's called, have you heard of compassion fatigue? There is just so much need, so much need. And you can just be, where the heck do I start? Or it might be, you've done so much in a day that it's like, I've just run out of. I haven't got anything left to give. But at other times, frankly, and this is one I'm probably more guilty of, I just don't want my comfort disturbed. I can't be bothered checking on that person, making that phone call, helping that uh, difficult individual. But people can also be, perhaps this is your experience, ungrateful, manipulative even. We can feel that we've been taken advantage of. No one notices. All of our best efforts don't seem to lead to any sort of lasting change. And so it can become so easy to, be, to give up, can't it? And to become, I guess, self-centred. Well, the writer to the Hebrew recognises that and says we can help one another by not allowing one another to give up. Not in a badgering sense, but it's in the sense of cheering one another on. Celebrating the things that we're involved in and encouraging one another. So I guess the question that I want to just throw to you tonight, and we're going to get you to discuss in a little while, is what would that look like in your life together as a church community at Hume Ridge? How could you be helpful to one another to be attentive to what God's purposes are for you on your front line? How could you help one another more in exploring that and, and going into those places that are sometimes a joy and are sometimes toxic? What things could you learn together that might help you when you're apart? What could you learn to, how could, what sort of things would, that would you learn together would help you when you're apart? In the years that I've been associated with this church at, over here at Hume Ridge, I think that's actually something that you already do well. Uh, Jen and I were here sitting somewhere back there on Sunday morning and we loved the way at the end that if you were here, you'll remember that Ross shared about his front line, footy of course, wrong breed but anyway. Um, and he talked about the impact that he'd been able to have there, not because he was a pastor, but because of what he did as a coach and how he'd built some relationships there, he built some credibility in that space. And so then it became a natural thing to say, well, would your kids like to come along? And I think he said they've been coming two weeks or something, these group of kids. So Ross is setting an example, cheering you all on so that you would imagine new possibilities on your front lines, that you would be alert to the possibilities of what God might already be doing there so you don't have to be a paid pastor to cheer one another on though do you absolutely not something we can all do and so shortly we, we just want to give you a chance to reflect on how you might encourage one another when you uh when you gather how could you what how would you pray differently i think we've got a, a life group here and I, is there was there another life group we had one another this group here yeah, you might think about what would you do differently in your life group as a result of these sessions to encourage one another? It might only be something, it might be just 
spending a few minutes each evening checking out how the front line's going. I'll leave that to you, let you think about all that. What questions, what conversations might you have after church that are different uh, as a result of thinking about these things? Uh, we don't have a lot of young people in this session, but you meet them on Sunday morning. What sort of que what could you ask them that would encourage them at school or at uni or in their tra tradies doing their thing? I'm not a very tradie person, but Phil, you can remind us later what that means, okay? Third point, quickly. The writer urges his readers to keep meeting together. I want to be really clear here that in emphasising front lines, I am emphatically not suggesting that our life together, our gathered times, are not important or less important. In fact, they are absolutely crucial for the race that's marked out for us, as it says in Hebrews. Because it's when we gather that we're reminded of these core elements of our faith. And if this is the community that will help you remain faithful to your calling, and if this is the community that will affirm the significance of what you do from Monday to Friday, Saturday, then meeting together is absolutely vital. Gathering is actually a spiritual discipline. As much as reading your Bible, as much as prayer, gathering is a spiritual discipline. I wasn't always overjoyed with it, but my parents used to drag, sorry, take us to church every Sunday morning, evening, sometimes in the afternoon, but it established a pattern and a habit that has served me well and helped me to grow steadily as a disciple. Gathering was a priority in our family. It was a spiritual discipline. So the gathered life, worshipping life of your church is where you get taught, guided, challenged, equipped, encouraged, loved, commissioned, we're going to do that later, for the lives that we have on our front line. I love it when people get excited about their front lines. I love it when they get a sense of what God might want to do through them in those places. And I, lo I love it when they start to see, particularly people in a workplace, I love it when they see their daily work as an expression of the way they worship God and uh, as a vocation. I love it when they say, I feel called to be a plumber. I feel called to be in aged care or whatever it happens to be. I feel called to this particular neighbourhood to reach out to my neighbours and so on. So, but, but I want to just give a word of warning because as we've talked about these things over the years, I, know, I have known some folks who became so committed to their front lines that they neglected meeting together. And in fact, front lines became some sort of an excuse for not gathering. Come make it Sunday, I'll be on the front line was sort of like a real spiritual excuse. Or I can't get to life group, I'm you know, busy on my front line. I think we need to see gathering and scattering as a both and, not an either or. We scatter and we gather as God's people. That's the rhythm of our life. We'll show you a little video later that I think expresses this beautifully. So I want to finish just with um, some words from <laughs> um, Mark Green that I think sums up the importance of gathering in community, words that were written, interestingly, before COVID hit. But you might just want to overlay the whole COVID situation. Uh, I think sometimes it'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? Sunday morning, you know, sit and not get out of your PJs. None of you would be like that. If you're prepared to come out here on a cold Sunday evening, I'm sure you're still making it on Sunday. But Mark writes these words. <coughs> Excuse me. We gather together for a vital and often neglected reason. You can, after all, sing along to a worship song on your phone. Choose one with lyrics that precisely fits the issue that you are dealing with and in a musical style that precisely fits your mood. You can read your Bible on your own and remind yourself of the great truths of the Christian life on your own. Summon up a web sermon in the comfort of your own bath Yes, from, <laughs> from any number of world-class Bible expositors or inspirational speakers on the topic that particularly interest you at that particular moment. You can confess, praise, thank, 
intercede on your own, text a prayer request to a friend. You can customise it all precisely to your own tastes and you can ensure that your service ends in good time to catch the beginning of the Grand Prix. It's a mark thing. But it's not enough and it's not meant to be enough. God may certainly be present to those of his people who are cut off from fellowship with his followers by sickness or persecution or circumstance, but it is not meant to be that way. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a church to raise a disciple. It takes a church to sustain a disciple. Our community shapes us and our gathering is together is vital to that. So, chance for you now. We'd love you to have a little bit of a chat uh, together and explore some of those things. So, I hope you, you're not alone there, are you? You've got people you... Neil will come and talk to you. Uh, <laughs> arrange yourselves in just a moment. Let me just tell you what we want you to do. I want you to talk... There you go. Um, I want you to talk through this through. The early church to whom the Hebrews was written seemed to have been tempted to stop meeting. Maybe their previous way of life seemed attractive again. Maybe being out of step with society was getting difficult. Or maybe they were just busy. When have you been tempted to give up on meeting together? What's kept you going? What's the best thing about gathering with fellow Christians? Okay? Three questions, ten minutes or so. Please form your little groups. Caleb's all alone up there. Oh, no, not Caleb. Um, yeah, you sort yourselves out. Thank you. We'll give you a, a warning bell. Okay, if I could have your attention. I hope you got past question one. <laughs> yeah, this group over here is very famous for going in circles. They're, I think you're linearly challenged or something would be the expression. A sound guide, does that explain everything? Oh, up and down. All right. Um, just in a moment, I'm going to show you this week's uh, little video. You know, these little ones with our plumber friend and our coach and our office lady. And what's the fourth one? The granny. How could I forget the granny? Um, <laughs> so I'll just show you that. I, I'm just talking to Neil. For those of you who uh, are on Facebook or something, you might like to... Look, a lot of these resources have come from the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. And it, you might want to follow them. They produce some fantastic materials. I was just saying to Neil, at the moment they're doing some sort of 40-day journey around different frontline stories and things like that. They regularly pray for different groups and things. So if you wanted to get into some of their resources, just type in LICC and it should come up and uh, I think you'd enjoy it. But anyway, here's tonight's little video. Gathered, welcomed, celebrated, restored, gathered together, encouraged, supported, loved, reminded who God is, hearts awed by his majesty, eyes seeing fresh, the wonder of grace, thankful, for his awesome, unwavering love. Reminded who I am. And all I have received. Challenged. Oh, Equipped. Renewed. Commissioned. Ready. Sent. We'd like to give you the chance now to just reflect um, on the, I guess, the things that we've been learning over the last few weeks together. 
And so we've got a few questions there for you to just ponder, share together. What have you learned about yourself? What have you learned about one another? What have you been reminded about, about God? What's become clearer about the relationship between scattering and gathering, life of our church? What's, what is more challenging? Is it scattering or is it gathering or is it some combination of those? And what stories have you shared with one another that have most encouraged you? Okay, so we want you just to do a little bit of reflection time. What's happened over these... Not all of you have been here every week, um, so you might need to fill others in. Um, But we'd love you just to take a few minutes just to share the things that have been most helpful to you, I guess, uh, in summary, over these weeks. And try and stay on track, you lot. All right. You can go in any order you like, (laughs) because what chance would we have to control you anyway? (laughs) Okay, have have some time together thinking about a bit of reflection time. Thank you. Thank you, folks. That's great. Um... Enjoyed listening in on some of your conversations there. I was, uh, I think one of the front lines that we often neglect is actually just our neighbourhood. I listened to a fascinating conversation. I don't know who, no, whose name it was, but finding out the different people in the neighbourhood and the number of people that were actually Christians. We had a weird experience this morning. Some of this is weird, some of it's not. I got kicked out of bed at 6.20 because I was snoring. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was not the weird part, that's normal. Um, But it was good because I got to prepare a bit more for tonight. Next thing, thing Jen came in and tells me that um, the next door neighbour, the the grandmother from India has been over for the last two years, Didi, uh, we've got to know her. She cannot speak any words of English. She comes in waving her arms around at 6.30 this morning. You know, we're we're still dressing gowns and this sort of stuff and muttering something about or pointing to something about an air conditioner. Jen had no idea what she was talking about or what she needed to happen. But she's smart, my wife. So she rang Jigger, who's the other Indian family up the road, who don't come from anywhere near the same part of India, but do speak some of the same dialect. So she rang Jigger, and Jigger came down and talked to Didi, and apparently what had happened was the kids had left and left the air conditioning on, and she was going to be there all day just dying in the heat or whatever it was. So we were able to help our next-door neighbour, Indian neighbour, who we, we can't speak to but because we knew. And all of that's come about, I'm not trying to, this is not a big head thing, just because of over the last five years of building relationships and uh, having people over to our home. We've had a, like a soup night, we have a couple of Christmas parties and it becomes the sort of go-to place for community gathering. Um, And, yeah, so it's just, it's really interesting. You know, I think one of the biggest hindrances to relationships in community is the electric garage door. Because we get home, we press the button, we drive in, we press the button, and we're cut off from the world. And we've we've learnt, we're not brilliant at it, but we're just trying to be so much more intentional uh, winter's the hardest time, summer's good, you can get and walk, but you just have to be so much more intentional. So I find myself driving home this way sometimes, knowing I'll probably just be able to touch contact and say good day to Tanya, or this way another time, hoping that I'll just bump into so-and-so. Um, so, anyway, I don't know if that's got anything to do with this, but it has got something to do with the next one. Uh, I'm going to show you a little video. It goes for about eight minutes or so. It's put together came out of the blue to me, young, a lady called Naomi Compton in New Zealand. And it's actually called Church on Wednesdays. Did you like that? Church on Wednesdays. And uh, if you just change your thinking from red dots to yellow triangles, you'll really get a lot out of this video. You got that? Okay. So she talks yellow triangles rather than red dots. Um, Jen's seen it before. It's quite, I think, very helpful in terms of wrapping together many of the ideas we've talked about, particularly in terms of gathering and scattering. Breathing. It's a pretty basic part of life. Something we don't often think about. I never imagined it would be a practice I would need to pay special attention to. 
to relearn. And yet that's exactly what I had to do. In my 20s, I was often unwell with minor things, headaches, fatigue, a sore tummy, just generally feeling run down. It was as if every part of my body was out of sync. Eventually, I met with a breathing specialist. I was diagnosed with hyperventilation syndrome. You see, I had an unhealthy habit of inhaling too fast and too often. Turns out that breathing out is just as necessary as breathing in. The natural rhythm of breath. Haki roto, haki waho. It causes the many parts of the body to be nourished and stimulated to function as they're supposed to. The expanding and contracting movement of the diaphragm, for example, as it sits beneath the lungs, enables healthy digestion of the gut. But I had taught my body that the inhale was really the essential thing. I'd conditioned it to rely heavily on breathing in and in and in to the point that I would often find myself sighing as my body claimed even more oxygen, thinking it was running out. It took months to retrain myself to breathe, lying on my back, on the floor, focusing on the exhale, breathing out and again, until I found a rhythm of balance. Ha ki roto, ha ki waho. Hyperventilation causes the body to be unwell. Too much gathering the air into oneself is actually harmful. Breathing out makes up half of this basic practice, which is necessary for life and for flourishing. The body of Jesus Christ is the church, and its rhythm of breathing is to gather and to scatter, coming together as disciples, people who follow the way of Jesus and carry forth the mission of Jesus and then going out as disciples, spreading to our corners of the world, following the way of Jesus and carrying forth his mission in everyday contexts. However, our churches seem to have a bad case of hyperventilation syndrome. Gathering in has become unnaturally accentuated. We've conditioned our local church bodies to believe that gathered life is really the only essential thing. And as a result, we present with symptoms of a hyperventilating church. We're pretty familiar with what it means to be church on Sundays. Pastors, leaders devote hours towards planning and curating Sunday services and other times of gathered prayer and worship and service. Ha ki roto. But breathing out has become a lost art. Little thought is given to the exhale of the body of Christ, the many parts scattering into their everyday ordinary lives, their going to work and walking around lives. Ha ki waho. How much do we realize that breathing out is necessary for the health of the church? Jesus calls everyone to follow him, then gives his spirit to carry forth his mission. What is the mission of Jesus? He's basically creating little pockets of heaven. And he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. Christ is making all things new. All things. And he's doing it through us, his body. We carry forth his mission. So as we scatter, haki waho, we co-create these little pockets of heaven in our corners of the world. So how can we find balance and retrain the body to breathe? How do we scatter and be the body of Christ on Wednesdays as well as on Sundays? As people enter their ordinary everyday worlds, their office, the construction site, school, their dining room table, Jesus promises he's already there. He's been there for a while. And this gives cause for his church to do three things. To wonder, to imagine, and to see. If Jesus is making all things new, it must cause his followers to wonder. You know, perhaps there is something more going on here. Perhaps there's another way to do things here. I wonder if Jesus is up to something extraordinary here. If Christ is making all things new, then someone who follows him must wonder and then imagine. 
Imagine what God has planned for this space, through this work, and in these other people around me. Imagine what part He's equipped me to play. If God really cares about this corner of His world, then we've got to lean into the imagination of God Himself, picturing what He pictures, what His kingdom will look like here. And if Jesus is making all things new, then His people will see We'll see it as it unfolds. We will see how Jesus chooses to bring it about through people. We'll see how people and cultures are transformed. As his body scatters, we will see little pockets of heaven established in our ordinary, everyday spaces. Haki waho. Wonder if. Imagine what and see how. Breathing out is just as necessary for the health of the body. And pastors are called to serve this body of Jesus Christ. They work to build up the life of his body. How then can pastors serve the church as we relearn how to breathe? Think of Aaron and her holding up the arms of Moses as he carried forth the mission of God. Like this, pastors can support the arms of followers of Jesus as they carry forth the work of Christ in their everyday spaces. Pastors support the serving arms of their local church people as they prompt them, as they join them, and as they witness. Pastors build up the church as they prompt followers of Jesus to wonder, as they remind them again and again to wonder, not in abstract ways, but in the context of their everyday, ordinary, going to work and walking around lives, prompting them to wonder if perhaps there's something extraordinary going on beneath the surface. Pastors prompt their people to wonder and then pastors join their people to imagine. Christ is making things new out there in the middle of the world where followers of Jesus live every single day of their lives. Pastors must join them there to imagine what Jesus has planned there, to imagine how God has equipped this follower to carry forth Christ's mission in that place. And as followers see how Christ's mission unfolds, pastors must give witness to the work of God. Pastors must make a point of noticing and bringing others to notice the ways that Christ is making all things new. Ha ki waho. Pastors, prompt your people to wonder if. Join your people to imagine what. Give witness as your people see how little pockets of heaven are created in their relationships, in their place of work, in their work itself, in the things they create, in their vocations. Ha ki roto. Ha ki waho. Breathing is a basic and essential part of life in the body. I wonder if our Sunday church might look different if church members and pastors alike spent time focusing on the exhale, on being the scattered church. Imagine what God has planned for his people and through his people who relearn to breathe, breathing in and breathing out the renewing power of his spirit. May we see little pockets of heaven come in the ordinary middle places of the world. Church, body of Ihu Karaiti, Ha ki roto, Ha ki waho. I'll be thinking of little pockets of heaven for the rest of the week. <laughs> Um, I hope that uh, has stimulated your thinking and we've just got one last set of questions that we'd like you to just have a think about uh, before we do something I think that's going to be quite special tonight. So think about these questions. How could your, and you've probably already started talking about this, but Neil's going to bring around some pieces of paper. We'd love to get a bit of some feedback here. So if you've got something to share at the end, we'd, Neil's going to collect those. Um, how could your Sunday gathering, your life group sessions help you to spur one another on to love and good deeds? 
in your Monday to Saturday lives? How could you help one another to wonder, imagine and see? Maybe you want to give some thought to how your church leaders um, could prompt, join, witness. What's the one thing you don't want to lose from this series? What's the one thing, one thing that you'll do as a result? of our times together on Frontline Wednesdays. So, some time together, a final chit-chat, and then we've got, we've got one f final thing that we want to do together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we might just pull it together there. Can I encourage you, if you've got some thoughts there, um, to jot them down, uh, and please pass them on to Neil. Uh, we could have made that more formal, but there might be something that's come out of that where you think these are things that would actually help us to wonder to imagine, to see our front lines and uh, so forth. Um, we've asked Ross to join us, um, to come and share with us uh, a commissioning prayer tonight as we head out on our front lines. I do hope that you've got a sense of those. In some ways, none of this is actually very new. Um, some of you will have gone, why is this so special? But sometimes the language is important. And I think front lines is such a powerful a bit of language in the way that it helps us to rethink about some of those things, help us to rethink the places where we go Monday to Saturday where God's put us. And so Ross has kindly left the Stumpy's mob and he's going to lead us in uh, prayer of commissioning. Um, I'll hand over to Ross. Stumpy's uh, kids have made you bookmarks and they're going to come in and present them but they've actually taken a quote from Mark Green's book, which simply says, every contact leaves a trace. Every contact you have with someone can leave a trace of grace. But on the back, they've written you a note. So you're all getting a bookmark um, in just a few minutes. Uh, they'll come in and do it. They were supposed to just give me one to show, but Lene brought me everyone's. So we'll see how we go. Can I just say, um, before I do this, part of it is that I'll read something and you respond. You'll see the response on the screen. So, um, But I want to just say thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the things you're talking about and have been talking about and we're going to continue to talk about is where we need to be going. I uh, went to a luncheon yesterday with the uh, senior pastor of Highlands, the senior pastor of, Met, uh, of Civic, and the senior pastor of Rangeville um, Community Church. I always feel like I'm a bit of an imposter at those uh, uh, luncheons. These are all fellows that have been senior pastors for so long and all doing all sorts of wonderful things. Um, can I say that all three of them have just come back from pretty major conferences? Apparently the fellow who is in charge of the ACC churches that um, Civic are part of, he's in charge of Great Britain and Europe. He's just been here in Toowoomba leading a conference and they've had all sorts of speakers. I'm, I'm still thinking this through, but all of them say without a shadow of a doubt that the era the church has been in has finished. We are in a new era and we have to catch up quick. And all of them said the days of relying on on your Sunday service are over. One of them said, if you're just relying on your Sunday service, you won't be here for very long. It is going to be what happens in the week with your people being out there. And as your people take the mission that God has given to his church, which is you, into this world and into this community. But all of them, uh, are saying that for them it's been a, particularly a couple of them who have been very strong about their Sunday deal. This is a seismic shift. They all have said this, has, this is game changer stuff for them. And um, they said it without any hesitation. They've given me a book that I've got to read so I catch up. But I want to just say to you that... Um, as I've talked with Neil, as I've listened to some of the stuff, I really believe that you're on the front line of what our church needs to be about. Uh, I know we're all on our front lines. And I shared last Sunday that my front line is at Uni Cougars. That's where I'm 
have opportunities just to represent God in a way that hopefully warms people to the idea of God. But I'm very conscious of it. I'm very prayerful about it. Um, and God has been very faithful in giving opportunities. So I want to thank you for taking on this course. And I'm going to now read to you just a challenge. It will come up on the screen. We're going to ask you to stand and there will be a response that you will give back. Now, this is a little bit different for what we do here at Hume Ridge, but uh, we're going to have a crack at it. And so basically it's you giving a, a commitment back to the challenge that is given. So this is hopefully the first one. Looks right. As followers of Jesus Christ, will you embrace your front lines as places of possibility and potential in the purposes of God? Will you believe that God is already at work in these places? And will you give yourself unreservedly to his purposes in you and through you wherever you are? Will you trust God with the big things and the small things that you do day by day and seek to make all you do on your front lines a part of your worship of him? Will you learn to rely on him, his power, his love and his grace, whatever you do? As sons and daughters of your heavenly father, will you believe that your value your worth, your significance, and your life on the front line flow first from his identity, from this identity. Will you embrace the joy and freedom of being a child of God, whoever you are? With the help of God, we will. As the body of Christ, will you commit to encouraging and helping one another flourish in Christ and be fruitful on your front lines? Will you learn to be the people of God gathered and scattered, helping one another to make all the difference in the world? Based on your responses and your commitments, I would now like to commission you. So I'm going to pray and I ask you to join with me. Lord God, we affirm your call to follow Christ in all of life, including life on your front line. We commission you to this life and work and pledge to you our prayers, encouragement and support. May the Holy Spirit guide and strengthen you that in this and in all things you will know Christ and seek to make him known to the glory of God the Father. And now I ask you just to make this response and the response is up on the um, screen. We May the blessing of God go with you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of this community and we commend one another to you on our front lines. And I'm going to ask Neil now to come and he's going to take just a small part and then I'm going to finish up for us. Right, you might like to take a seat for a few moments. When you uh, get your bookmark, we'd like you also to take one of these red stones. We've always, well, always, each week we've given you something to take away. Well, tonight you've got two things to take away. But again, in keeping with the red item, it's a stone just to put somewhere, maybe on your desk, something like that, just to prompt you and remind you that together we grow. Okay. We want to take just a few minutes then tonight to say thank you. Uh, to a few people, I'd like to thank uh, Brendan and Caleb and Kent and Tammy. Tammy has done a lot of work behind the scenes, preparing uh, handouts and that sort of thing. She's not here tonight, but we'd like to say thank you to Tammy too. Uh, thanks also to uh, you for coming. As Ross said, it's been uh, uh, five weeks. is a good, you know, it's a good haul, uh, and to come out tonight's been very special. Uh, but I guess we also wanted to say thank you to Murray. So, Murray, thanks so much for coming and sharing with us. Now, I do have something here. <laughs> Come over here, mate. We just want to give you this. An envelope. 
And there's a card in there, and we'd like everyone, if they get a chance, if you could sign it, that oh. would be really good. Get a rock and sign it. I mean, a pebble, <laughs> a stone. Yeah, so get a pebble and sign it. And Murray, really appreciate uh, your input, uh, but just your commitment to this whole concept of the front line. So important. As Ross was saying, it is the future, and uh, we know that you know that uh, because it comes through in everything that you say. So God bless you and thank you. Thanks, brother. Now, we did, I think Brendan got a couple of photos before. So right at the very end, after Ross has his little bit, uh, we'll get you all to come down the front here and we're going to take a photo of the group together. OK, so Ross, over to you. So the kids will come in in just a second and uh, they'll distribute. Uh, we hope we've, they've done enough bookmarks. If not, you can fight over them. Um, we just want to say, look, um, we're just very aware that we have a lot to be grateful for in this church. And um, I want you to understand that um, I, I had the opportunity to show um, some people around our property uh, from Brisbane Churches of Christ. And um, what I said to them was that we are very blessed and we love our facilities, but we're not in love with our facilities. And I said to them, that we understand that the real treasure in this church sits in this room and in all the other rooms. That's our treasure. And it's what you're doing day by day that is making a difference. And it's what you enable to happen in this place and beyond. Can I just say that on Monday, um, over the weekend, we had a family, um, an Aboriginal lady and her three kids who slept here at the church because it was either in their car or here. So that was an easy deal. We made up beds, they had the rooms over the other side and they slept here. Um, Wednesday night, um, Jason and Emma Burstow were cooked, had a, a call, a prompt on their heart to go and visit somebody who's going through a really difficult time. They have been a victim of domestic violence. Their husband got out of jail on Monday. They took an overdose on Monday night and had not Jason and Emma followed the prompting and gone to the house, they found her uh, unconscious. Uh, Emma's a nurse, fortunately. She jumped in, they got the ambulance, she was rushed to hospital. So that was Monday. Um, Tuesday, um, we had some other things happen, and then Tuesday night, guess what? Winter shelter was on. And that was all systems go. And there have been all sorts of things that have gone on. And while that goes on um, here and around the place, it, it is this church, which is you, that is enabling that to occur and ministry to happen in all sorts of places. So I want to thank you for being equipped. I actually think... I'm becoming um, just as um, um, I, yeah, one-eyed, whatever it is, like Murray, uh, about this whole deal about front lines. I think we need to get it. You can bring them in now. So we'll do this quick and then we'll get the photos. Righto, we're going to uh, conclude with a prayer and then I'm going to ask if you come down, stand down here and we'll get a photo of the group together, okay? So let's stand. And we're praying, where are we praying? So let's pray together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of this community. We commend one another to you on our different front lines. Wherever we are, whatever we do, whoever we are, may the Holy Spirit guide us in all things so that we may do God's will in the world, in the service of Jesus Christ, and with great joy. Amen. We forgot, <laughs> we forgot our chips. Come on down. Thank you. Come and just form a group down here. Uh, taller at the back, shorter at the front, and we'll get a photo. Christ be in my waking as the sun is rising in my day of working 
with me every hour. Christ be in my resting as the day is ending, coming and refreshing, watching through the night. Christ be in my gladness for the joy of When hope has faded, nothing left to cling to, every pleasure jaded, every well is dry. Christ the loving shepherd draws me with his kindness, leads me from the desert to the streams of life.